There are some questions I understand from patients about specific issues. So the first question was about myelofibrosis. First of all, concerning weight loss with myelofibrosis. Um, now this can occur for several reasons. First of all, because the spleen becomes enlarged, mainly we think as it takes over the blood synthesizing capability and it happens to sit over the top of the stomach, so it squashes the stomach. So the patient then feels a bit full a bit earlier and so eats less. But also, as we have heard, myelofibrosis is an inflammatory condition and so the patient's metabolism is faster and at a higher rate. So they need more calorie input to maintain weight. Losing weight is um, not a good sign if it's unintentional. And so we always like to know about that from our patients. Ways of adjusting and treating that can include addressing spleen if that's a problem, can include changing diet, using dietary supplements, changing what, how you're eating in terms of trying not to eat big meals, but eat more frequent smaller meals, for example. Um, secondly, um, often weight loss, like many other symptoms with myelofibrosis, can require intervention. They indicate to us that the disease is affecting general health of the patient. And so um, this, along with other symptoms, such as sweating, for example, fever, can indicate that the disease is becoming more aggressive, often goes hand in hand with splenomegaly. And a very effective treatment for that is drug therapy. Principally, the one of interest at the present time is, of course, ruxolitinib, which is a JAK1 and 2 inhibitor. This drug is effective at restoring weight, and sometimes patients overshoot, and that can be a problem because we obviously don't want the risks of being overweight. But the other problem with ruxolitinib is because of its its ability to block JAK1 and JAK2, it's a targeted effect, it also can worsen anemia, which means a low haemoglobin level. And so we sometimes have to balance the risk and the benefit of the therapy. So we're be balancing benefits of symptoms and spleen and the survival advantage with that therapy against the side effects such as anemia. So the ways of managing that, there are several. First of all, is to think about where the anemia is occurring. Is it early in the course of disease treatment, in which case it might get better? So we see a clear kind of drop and then a return towards baseline. Are there other causes? Is the patient bleeding, etc.? Do they have nutritional def deficiencies? And then um, do we need to use blood transfusion or can we supplement other agents such as uh, erythropoietin, which is an ESA-like agent that stimulates red cell production, anabolic steroids, or do we need to moderate the dose of ruxolitinib? So if the anemia persisted, it's time for a careful look at how the patient is and how much the anemia is affecting them. Another interesting point is, well, actually, patients who are anemic on ruxolitinib tend to feel their anemia less. It's a slightly curious but ha happy coincidence that a patient who before might have felt they needed a blood transfusion when their haemoglobin was 9, uh, on ruxolitinib they often don't feel like that until the haemoglobin is lower. So um, depending on the individual patient factors, I might add another drug, I might reduce the dose, or I might just do a blood transfusion periodically, just being aware of the risks and benefits of each of those options.